truly is the town a church started, the Methodist church that has remained in the heart of the community since the founding, an era when open spaces beckoned the faithful to worship on a then faraway hillside. Now, a century later, truly a blessing to be celebrated. Woohoo! Congratulations on 100 years and here's to 100 more. To think of a centennial uh, and a fact that the church has reached this milestone as well as the community itself is huge. Happy birthday to church! We're glad to be a part of these 100 years. It's a progressive community, so the, the progressive thinking, um, you know, I've really definitely experienced that at the church. Um, is definitely part of the legacy. There's a lot of things that are happening here that make my life more enjoyable. Happy birthday, you Community United Methodist Church. I love you. <laughs> I really appreciate the tradition and the, the specialness of the people who love each other and just because they're part of this community. It is. It's a perfect, beautiful place. Indeed, from the Village Green to the Gateway Park, Will Rogers Beach to Rip Caruso's Village, the Huntington to the Highlands, the Methodist Tower to the Lake Shrine, the Via Bluffs to the Business Block. The community has embraced the modern while retaining its legacy. The small town feeling of the Pacific Palisades in general draws me back to a, a, an earlier time, a simpler time, and uh, it's just a good feeling to be here. Happy birthday. And within this community, the local congregation of its founding church continues to support spiritual growth and to provide welcome fellowship. I definitely get the sense that people have been here and have chosen to stay here and it's really a central part of the community, which is very cool. I wanted my children to have the same experience I did. I loved growing up here in the church. I just love the, the community of the church and the support that I get here, the friends that I've made here, and I just don't think I could have really gotten through so many things in my life without the support and um, without all the mighty prayer warriors that we have here. It feels like going to grandma's house. It just, you know, there's something going on here that, that connects you, that makes you feel at home. We really owe a debt of gratitude as we're celebrating a hundred years of all the people that have come before us. As this mural across from Pali High reminds us, Native Americans first discovered this idyllic place where the mountains meet the sea, long before anyone thought of calling it Pacific Palisades. In the 1800s, the Marcus family put down roots in Santa Monica Canyon. Their commercial ventures to be followed by the oh-so-long wharf for shipping, the pioneering Innsville movie studio, the LA Athletic Club wanted Rustic Canyon for their uplifter's ranch. Yet well into the 1900s, apart from some agriculture, the broad mesas remained largely undeveloped until along came the Methodists. So what happened was, at that moment, there's a wonderful gentleman, this gentleman right here, uh, Dr. Reverend Scott, uh, who was interested in the Chautauqua movement. In fact, Minister Charles Scott had been appointed to lead the search for a new Chautauqua site for the Southern California Methodist Conference, just like the boulevard, Chautauqua. We at Chautauqua are very proud of everyone who's a part of Chautauqua. Chautauqua's not baloney, man. Even an Elvis Presley movie tapped into the popularity of the Chautauqua movement, taking its name from the Chautauqua Institution in New York that set the standard for such rapidly multiplying gatherings. That brought people together in nature. And it was an interesting combination of culture and religion and kind of carny. Um, and it was for... It's, it's considered one of the most American institutions. 
Let's take a moment to meet our expert, Randy Young, lifelong Palisadian, historical society curator, and collaborator with his late mother, Betty Lou Young, on a series of volumes exploring the area's history. So here, here the town was starting here, and they put on the plays and productions. Temescal Canyon served as Chautauqua site, but the Methodists envisioned more, taking a lesson from the Chautauqua Institution and other locations where the Chautauqua campground became the focal point for new communities. And what they did is they decided, hey, why don't we go for a whole planned community? but around the principles of the Chautauqua, that it would be a community built around this, these cultural centers. And the Chautauqua would happen, you know, once a year, they'd have a large gathering, and this would have been the focus, the heart of the community. This is what Temescal Canyon was. The brochure seeking investors envisioned the world's greatest Christian resort and educational center. Resident Bishop Grant Hagia of the Methodist California Pacific Conference is impressed with his predecessors. I really revel in the foresight of those early leaders. You know, they had a vision. And a name proclaimed by one of the conference ministers, Reverend Scott brought to the bluffs to take in the view. And he looked out and he said, this is indeed the Pacific Palisades. To proceed, the Methodist Conference established the Pacific Palisades Association with Reverend Scott as president, buying a thousand plus acres. It was not long after the First World War with new appreciation for peace. Via de la Paz, Way of the Peace, is at center of an artist's idealized plan. Via stretching from the beachfront to what would be called Peace Hill, where a temple of peace was to be built. Well, artist A.E. Mitchell at least got some of it. Founders Day, January 14, 1922. The founders gathered amid oak trees to pick out home sites. 99-year leases secured by founders' certificates costing $1,000 apiece. Now, when the same site was chosen by more than one founder, the names went into a hat, and Reverend Scott's daughter Martha pulled out the winner. She was a little tyke, was the one who pulled the first number out of the big top hat, and she was the one who kind of kicked off this whole uh, uh, um, kind of dream. 76 years later, Martha Scott shared her memories with Young and spoke of her father, the founder. I've called him a revolving soul, somebody that grew through the years, wasn't stuck anywhere. Never did she hear him utter a profanity. Worst word he ever said was, my conscience, Anna. Anna, my conscience, and you know, he couldn't say even damn. On the other hand, daughter Scott acknowledged sometimes bristling at aspects of the moral code she felt expected to follow. I grew up thinking if I even touched a playing card, I was going to go to hell. But she still found wholesome fun. What uh, I enjoyed the most were hikes up towards Peace Hill. <laughs> Easter Sunday, 1922. Hundreds converged at sunrise on Peace Hill. No temple, but marked with a large cross and adorned with fields of lilies. As a young boy, uh, my memory is not so much of the sermons and all, but just the crowds of people and the Easter lilies. And after the service, we would walk down the, the uh, winding roadway, uh, dirt road, and everybody was carrying Easter lilies. Easter sunrise service became a Palisades tradition of many years, though eventually fading away, the lilies making way for homes. And yet, this past spring, this centennial year, Easter observance returned to the hilltop to a yard that attracted not only Methodists. It was lovely. It was just lovely. It was a simple service. On the other hand, it was intensely moving. The yard was made available by friend Frances, who pleaded camera shyness and nominated them to speak for her. Let's do it again and again every Easter. It's going to be wonderful. Nature is the purest form of God's grace and God's beauty. 
Pastor Wayne Walters. But being there and then thinking about a hundred years ago, people being on that hill, it is making us really connected with that something that's lasted that long. By that first hilltop Easter in the Palisades, the grading of roads with mule power was well underway, and the campground buildings in Temescal Canyon were taking shape. <laughs> July 1922, the Pacific Palisades Association hosted its first Chautauqua with powerful lectures, theatrical performances, and concerts. Contralto Ernestine schumann Hank was world-renowned. Baritone Lawrence Tibbet was a rising star bound for movies and the Metropolitan Opera. There is something about his voice that is different and richer than any voice that I am now hearing. She well remembers the tabernacle, also called the auditorium. It was large. It was very, very large. Now, it was a wooden structure and wooden kind of bench seats. It just commanded this canyon, and it was several hundred feet long, uh, and made of beautiful timbers. That the tabernacle and Chautauqua's made lasting impressions comes through loud and clear in oral histories shared with the Historical Society. Jean Engelmeyer Roof. Oh yes, the Chautauqua's, we were always very active in, in going to all the concerts. And on the other side of Sunset Boulevard, then Beverly, an amphitheater, youth play areas, and even more buildings, used not only during Chautauqua, but for other events and available to other groups the rest of the year, as Temescal Canyon remained the focus of the budding community. In fact, behind me over here was the first uh, meat market and grocery store. And it was where the uh, people coming for the Chautauqua could, could get groceries and people in the community. They hadn't really finished figuring out where they were going to put the business center when they built this. Some lived year-round in newly built canyon houses. Janet Clearwater's family did for a time. We could roam around the mountains and all over and never have really any fears. And uh, it was just a, a really wonderful place to grow up. Early Chautauqua attendees included Dr. and Mrs. H. J. Andrews, whose names you find in the church's memorial book of outstanding members, grandparents of Mary Sue Hart. My grandfather was a doctor in Hollywood, and they were coming out here to have um, the Chautauquas out here. So they, they had music and they had stories and they had all kinds of things up in the canyon. And they, they had tents and they came out and they got together in the summer. It wasn't just a, a campground, but, um, but really a place to, that could make a difference. And I think that's pretty powerful. There was definitely a religious side of it, but they also had just, they had people teaching about economy and world politics and, um, and the music was really important. The church commitment to music endures, from early music director Nancy Kendall Robinson, later Winifred Andrews, and today Ross Chitwood. <laughs> embracing both the traditional and the modern. Music builds community in a way that people don't really understand. Um, to be standing next to someone and singing with your full voice is very vulnerable and uh, allows you to hear the text differently than if you're just listening or following along. So music that the community is engaged in and involved in can change people. It's just this unifying force that brings us all together and gets your toe tapping and your heart pumping. But baby, please don't do it in heat. Channeling the Roaring Twenties, Christine Rosander performed at the church's 75th celebration. She continues to share her voice with the congregation. With the music here, what I've appreciated is, is that we still do a lot of traditional parts of the service 
and we combine that with the, with the new. So I think it's like a perfect balance. Sacred music is a really great way to connect to religion and to bring yourself closer to God and that's, that's how I bring myself closer to God. It's just the way I communicate. When the first Palisades Chautauqua Assembly was complete, those building the new community looked to establish a local year-round congregation. Construction Superintendent Clark Standiford got the ball rolling with a prayer meeting in the cafeteria, the minutes preserved. Among the original church members, Reverend Scott's sister Clarissa and her husband Robert Norris, a hard-working plumber. Decades later, son Charles Norris sat down with the Historical Society. So a lot of the early uh, houses that were built, uh, my father put in the plumbing. To son Charles, the founder, his mom's brother, was simply Uncle Charlie. Uncle Charlie was, was, uh, was the minister, etc. If that Norris name sounds familiar, you see it still on the former theater turned longtime hardware store that Anawalt took over in recent years. Also present at the beginning, the Clearwaters, Zola and Clifford, first postmaster, later publisher of the Palisadian newspaper. I feel like that one of the nicest things they ever did for me and my two brothers was to bring us up in Pacific Palisades. Moving there at the early time they did and living in that community was, as you look back on it, it was, it was paradise. <laughs> Clifford loved photography. Almost all the historic photographs in this video come from the Clearwater Collection, cataloged by the Pacific Palisades Historical Society and archived with the Santa Monica Public Library. If it weren't for Zola and uh, Clifford, uh, we wouldn't have this history. <laughs> Christmas Eve 1922, the first official church service, albeit still in the dining hall, the new congregation formally requesting district recognition, Reverend Scott taking on the added responsibility until the appointment of a new pastor, Dr. Oren Bradshaw Waite. Talk about a small world. The Palisades and his involvement in the Palisades was like lore in our family. The idea about the, this con big connection with Chris' uh, family, it didn't really hit me until I was here already. Yes, Pastor Wayne's wife Chris is the great-granddaughter of Dr. Waite. Next to Chris is her sister, Kim Hasse. He was invited by uh, Reverend Scott in 1923. He had been uh, serving a church up in Fair Oaks, California, up north. So, yeah, he came down with his family in, in April of 1923 and started uh, working with the association. That early, still not much to see. So there was this kind of tent community. There, I know there was a cafeteria. Um, there were a few buildings, but otherwise it was very open land. Their account of the era comes largely through Dr. Waite's son, their grandfather, the late Reverend Harlan Waite. <coughs> now you know where the puppy Chris trained got his name, Grandfather Harlan. He talked about um, mm -hmm. Will Rogers' polo field, and they would go out and play, you know, as if they were playing polo on his polo field. Bicycle polo. In 1996, Reverend Harlan Waite himself shared that story with Randy Young. We would go down there and find broken mallets and uh, beat up balls, and we'd take them up and uh, uh, remake the handles so we could handle them on our bicycles, and then we would play polo on our bicycles. And that was just the beginning of what the early rural palisades had to offer kids. The snakes and the, all the different, there were road runners, like all kinds of wildlife that he was just really enamored with. And I think that affected the rest of his life. Um, just he loved being outdoors. Young Harlan's mother, not so much, especially the early months when they made their home in a tent. I laugh because, well, we did hear stories like that our great-grandmother was not a huge fan of living in, in <laughs> the camps. Yeah. yeah, but I, you know, I think about it and especially, you know, think about my grandfather as, a, mm -hmm. as you know, a kid and like, oh man, that had to have just been so much fun and, and so interesting. So, and, you know, and to have that kind of, all those programs that would be, you know, like coming to you 
Um, I mean, I think like, it sounds amazing. It was, I think, a very unique period of time in a very unique community that he grew up in. Harlan's dad, Dr. Waite, beyond his pastorship, had extensive responsibilities for the Palisades Association. Well, the old timers really said he was actually the shaker and mover. He's the one who put together how the facilities would interact with each other, uh, where uh, uh, services would be held. He was kind of the air traffic control. No, I'll put it this way. He was the conductor. And that included overseeing the camp programs, especially the Chautauqua. They really had world-class yeah. people coming in, and that was one of the things that Oren did. Oren and Ethel every year would travel around the country looking for people that would then come to the summer program that he was responsible for. In recent years, Kim helped her grandmother, Anna, complete a biography of Dr. Waite begun by Reverend Harland. A book called Child of Hope, Man of Honor, The Faith and Life of Oren Bradshaw Waite. And that stern face? Prim, I think, is the word that my grandmother used about him. He was always very proper. He had a sense of humor, and, you know, he also loved nature. Um, he would collect all kinds of things, go yeah. down to the beach. But, yeah, he was always suit and tie. It was Oren Waite who proposed the system of naming the streets of Palisades Founders Tract 1 after Christian leaders and Founders Tract 2 after small Christian colleges. There was the competition, they, and he was the one who judged it. And, and so, yeah, he had everything to do with it. Which we thought as kids was like the coolest thing ever. After a decade in the Palisades, the time came for Dr. Waite to move on to other assignments. He did other things, but nothing that was ever as um, enriching for him personally as what he'd done here. My description was like the hippies of the 20s because it was this very, mm -hmm. I think, progressive, progressive. thinking about, mm -hmm. you know, being an, I mean, it was kind of a commune in a way, but, you know, still very formal, obviously very informed by the church. But, um, but very much, very, very progressive and, you know, very, a very thinking people mm -hmm. that, that gathered. Thinking, but also somewhat insular. It probably was about creating a like-minded community, quite honestly. Some glaring shortcomings must be acknowledged, most especially the racist, restrictive covenants that for decades excluded people of color. Not unique to the Founders' Palisades, but not rejected. Consider the bitter irony for Reverend Toyohiko Kagawa, the revered Japanese Christian leader and social activist for whom the Alphabet Street was named. Later, he actually visited. And so they took him to see his street. And, and he was very nice, and, and one of the locals kind of turned to another local and said, you know, he can visit it, but he can't stay here. Only years later would such restrictions be struck down. I remember my father and mother arguing about whether or not that was an okay thing. All I know is it wasn't okay. Trying to keep control over the Palisades would prove costly, even self-defeating for the Palisades Association. In the mid-20s, when the Huntington property became available and came under consideration as site for a Catholic college, the association borrowed money to buy it and doubled down by investing in luxury infrastructure. That was the fatal overreach because they went hugely into debt. What's worse, growth had slowed and revenue was plunging even before the Great Depression. Original trustee and Scott friend Robert C. Gillis brought resources from his Santa Monica Land and Water Company, but it was not enough to save the Palisades Association. Founder Reverend Scott was reassigned. The Temescal Camp Gathering of 1933 would prove to be the last. They hoped that they would be able to start it up again, and that never happened. He did not talk much about the business of the association at home. He talked about people. Ultimately, the association went under, its land holdings sold off. It was the kind of death knell of that kind of dream of, of this kind of uh, uh, religious, uh, cultural, Community. A point of no return in the Palisades' transition from Methodist enclave to affluent bedroom community. In his 1972 book, The Town a Church Started, Pastor Emeritus John Gabrielson wrote, 
Thus ended the high expectation for a Methodist center that had hoped to serve the Southland culturally, educationally, and religiously. The lower end of the Temescal campground became the All Hollows Farm, later Palisades High School. The Presbyterian Synod acquired the Upper Canyon and set about reviving it for camps and assemblies. They wanted to do, uh, you know, keep the tradition alive of having big gatherings. Um, but it, it was already in the wane. In 1994, it became a public park with the YMCA keeping Simon Meadow on sunset. Randy Young showed us what remains from the assembly camp's early days, including many of the small houses called casitas. We walked the same trails that did Chautauqua goers a century ago. You'd come from the dining hall and you'd hike and you'd go to your lodging, which is these wonderful little, they call them casitas. And uh, they, there are several still still existing. Behind the repurposed markets, the original cafeteria also remains. But just up the hill, a maintenance yard now occupies what was once the site of that wondrous tabernacle. I find it kind of sad that it was destroyed. Cleared in part to make way for a freeway never built and for fire safety. Also destroyed was the belfry. Its magnificent bell, young Harlan Waite, sometimes got to ring. I remember it had such a wonderfully rich sound. You could hear that bell a long distance. Belfry gone, but the bell survives. And to this day, now rings in the cloister of the Pasadena First United Methodist Church, whose long-ago pastor Merle Smith had named Pacific Palisades. The Founders Oak Island does remain preserved on Haverford, but much of the past has been lost. Back in the old assembly camp, we paused near the giant oak where Chautauqua goers would gather, and at night even watch movies projected onto a bedsheet. It really was an amazing place. But amid the association's decline, excitement at 801 Via de la Paz, groundbreaking at long last for a community church on property donated by Gillis along with construction seed money. The congregation just needed to raise the rest. Orrin actually led the campaign to raise $45,000 to fund the construction. At the base of the tower, Mary Sue Hart will show you where to find the cornerstone. It says Pacific Palisades Community Methodist Episcopal Church, 1929 A.D. The cornerstone was laid on August 18th, which was actually our grandparents' anniversary. By the following February, it was ready to welcome the faithful, at least to the first phase that ended abruptly at the tower. The signboard planted in the front yard promised an actual sanctuary someday, but for a long meantime... We are in the, the old sanctuary. Indeed, for many years, worship services were held in the multi-purpose room now known as Tokes Hall. Services for not only the Methodists, but also other denominations, as this was considered the community's church. Mary Sue's memories here date to when she was still so young that while seated, her feet did not touch the floor. I sat down and my little legs stuck straight out. And I was just like this, and it was moving around. No doubt anxious for the dedicated sanctuary, the church finally had funds to begin building in the late 40s, with massive laminated arches supporting an airy ceiling. Mary Sue remembers the anticipation and then elation when it was ready. It was very exciting, and we had these wonderful, very special stained glass windows. In this sanctuary, I remember a 9.30 and an 11 o'clock service. And I think we probably had three or four hundred people in both. Growing up in the Palisades post-World War II, Mary Sue remembers how rustic it still was even then. It was all about um, 
um, community there. You didn't have to watch your kids. They could all run about in the canyon. Let's keep Mary Sue as our docent to show us other changes over the years. We are in the old hallway off of the original sanctuary. This is now our preschool, but it wasn't our preschool then. It was uh, the baby's room. 1967 brought another big add-on. For the Toke side, a new lounge, kitchen, lobby, and office. An adjacent row of second-story rooms enclosed the courtyard. And the sanctuary gained a new foyer known as the Northex. Mary Sue remembers the year well because it was when she and spouse Dick Hart were married. The pews full of well-wishers, but the Northex floor was not finished in time with only a bare subfloor. That's all concrete. That concrete had just been poured because everything lags when you're trying to get married. Much of the more recent interior updating has been done with an appreciation of the history and tradition by Mary Sue's son, Chuck Hart, builder and fourth generation member. I'm part of it. Yeah, I feel it. I am part of it. My grandparents, my parents, uh, my great grandparents, my kids come here. Uh, it's a it's kind of a big deal. My name is Sharon Kanan. I was a young bride and in 61 we moved, 65 we moved up here and I've been here ever since. It's just a great place to, to find the Word of God and carry it out into today's world which is absolutely changing as the Palisades has changed. Nancy Wheeler Branch, everybody had, was great attitude, uh, friendly, uh, warm, w welcoming. Um, I was happy. I am Michelle Aiken. I'm John Aiken. It's been such a pleasure for us to be part of this church family and um, it gives us so much that we'll just be here for a while. My name is Joe Ford. I've been with this church since I was 11 years old. I was a preschool teacher here. I met my wife here. Uh, and my daughter, who's behind me right now, uh, went to preschool here. And this is like my second home, I gotta tell you. Bella, can you make an appearance real quick and say hi? There's my daughter right there. My name is Sam Nichols and I've been coming to the church since about uh, 1998, we're doing outreach in the community, the homeless programs that we're supporting, and it's just something that to give back to the community in a way that I'm not able to do in my regular job. My name is Christine Odianyu. I have been a member of the church for seven years, same as Pastor Wayne and Chris. Coming to church, being a liturgist, a greeter, uh, the communion of the church, the people of the church. I just love everything about the church. I'm Ruth Dewar. Happy birthday, Pacific Palisades, and happy birthday, Methodist Church, and I'm very happy that I found you. I am Carly Wright, and I found this church because I was looking for a smaller church to visit. I had gone to bigger churches prior and just needed that community feeling that I grew up with uh, back in the South. Bryce Swanson. Um, I discovered the church here probably five years ago, give or take. Gloria Miyoko Young, and I started seven years ago when the pastor first started. My name is Annette Rosilli, and I've lived in the Palisades and been acquainted with the church uh, for almost 60 years. My name is M. Schultz, and this is my second week. Warner. Andrew. Indian. Tara. Anders. What did you write today? Um, I write about Jesus. I said, I love church, and I also about Jesus. My name is Joey Hargrove. I am the youth director here. I'm also the director of Family Ministries. I think there are a lot of people who are never here on Sunday morning who still consider this their church. And that's because we have so many programs during the week for kids, for youth, um, where people really feel comfortable when they come in these walls, even if they never make it to a Sunday morning service. Vicki Borland, and I've been coming to Community United since 1975 when we moved to Palisades. Uh, my late husband, Len, and I moved here with our three young daughters. Hi, I am Christine Borland. 
I moved with my family to Pacific Palisades uh, when I was starting second grade. Every generation of the family will tell you Lynn loved the history here. The history of the church as well as the life of the church to him was so meaningful. In fact, your dad was the driving force behind there being a big party for the centennial. <laughs> yes, this was huge to him. He, this, he will be so proud of all of us, everyone, the entire church community for um, celebrating this very, very special occasion. It's special and that the Methodists founded our little town. It's, uh, we're lucky to be part of all of this, be so connected to it. Everyone's excited. It's just a special time. Congratulations to the 100th birthday of the Palisades and this wonderful community. It's hard to believe we're already at the 100th. It seems like yesterday was doing the 75th. Sylvia Grebe and her late husband Bill arrived in the early 80s. She joined the choir. His legacy includes bringing the apostles to life for children with a book and a show. The bronze monument to Reverend Scott in Temescal Canyon. Let's all wish a happy birthday to the Pacific Palisades and many more. Bill organized the celebration of the 75th when we heard from a member since the beginning, Martha French Patterson. The entertainment for the community in those days was centered in this church. I was a member of the Methodist Youth Fellowship, which was then called the Epworth League, and everything in the community centered around the church. I love this church, I love this community, I don't ever want to leave. Martha Patterson lived to see 99 years, and to this day, her feelings for the community and the church live on in so many. People for whom the long-standing Methodist presence in the Palisades is comforting and powerful. I can see the church steeple and cross right from my back door, my backyard, and it's been beckoning me for years. Atop the tower is the simple cross from Peace Hill, visible for decades till found toppled in 1947. But that was not the end. The cross was brought to the church and returned to prominence, illuminated at night, a rotating beacon for the community. It felt so welcoming, and when we, I could see it driving, we knew we were home and close to home. So I just love the feeling. Especially at night, when I look at the cross at the top of the church, it just warms my heart. I mean, it just almost brings me to tears in a way. Sorry. It's been a hundred years, and all the differences that we have made in, in lives, thousands of lives, um, but and this is just the beginning. The whole feeling of community was here, and we'd love to have that remain and, and to even grow. I would like to see more involvement with the community and the church to have a larger role in the community that we um, provide services to. So that would be my hope that um, uh, your church would provide that sense of outreach. And um, there are so many hurting people in the world. I think we have a, a message of hope and community that really could reach them. I would like to see the expansion of the church in the sense of having more people know of it, know what strength it can give, uh, and want to come and be part of the community. I'd like to see perhaps a little expansion um, of the church, um, a little growth in uh, membership of the church. Um, but of course, I, I, I don't want it to lose its uh, small town feel. There's a poem, author unknown, that the family of the early pastor, Dr. Orrin Waite, chose to include in his biography. History exceeds us, despite an attempt to wall it off behind us or to enthrone it, gilded on high. The past is anything but bygone. For it is in giving that we receive. Pastor Wayne recited a centuries-old prayer when called on to speak at the mid-centennial celebration inside a tent in Temescal Canyon, evocative of the early Chautauquas. And indeed, the Chautauqua spirit lives on at Palisades Methodist. We were just a gathering of people, which hopefully is still what we are. Or as Elvis Presley's young co-stars put it, The method is much better cooking than the Lutherans also.
in the walls and bust at your brains, but baby, please don't do it in here. And let's continue on. <laughs> Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to, to our, our church, church community! community. <laughs>